Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Peters, and I'm going to do a little bit of a lecture here on the radiology review of the abdomen. We're going to start off with some plain film and uh, CT findings. And as we go through, uh, I'm going to start with the abdominal anatomy as it regards to axial CT imaging. First of all, you have to know that when we do um, CT scans of the abdomen, we sometimes use contrast media, and sometimes we don't. We can use oral contrast, and this is in the form of short drinks or long drinks. The short drinks are used to visualize the stomach and the proximal small bowel, whereas the long drinks are used to visualize the small and the large bowel. We can also use intravenous contrast. These are iodine compounds that we inject in the arm. And we can catch the contrast within the abdomen in three separate phases. We can catch it in the arterial phase, and this is done to show the aorta and its branches, the venous phase to show the systemic veins, and the portal venous phase, which is to show the portal veins and their branches. And so that's the way we, we do it. And depending on what's wrong with the patient, we prescribe um, what exactly the technologist should do before they take the this is a view of the upper abdomen. You can see on the right and the left sides. And if we look at this, this is the liver over here. And we have the spleen on the other side. And when you're looking at a CT scan, it's like looking from the feet up through the head so that everything is uh, oriented that way. And the right side is to your left, and the left side is to your right. And that's the way we do it. Other images we'll see in the upper abdomen include the aorta. These little triangular shaped hats here, these are the adrenal glands, with one on each side. This is part of the pancreas, and we can see it sitting here in the center. It's sort of a fluffy texture. It has more fat in it than a lot of other things. These are vessels that are going around the pancreas, including the splenic vein, which sits on top of the pancreas. This is the air bubble in the stomach. And finally, we get a little bit of lung coming in here. Okay, These are the, the edges of the diaphragm here on each side. And of course, the inferior vena cava, which sits here right next to the aorta. And it's in the retroperitoneum all the way down uh, into the pelvis. We go down a little further in the abdomen. We get some other structures, which you can see here. We can see the liver. Again, we notice the kidneys now because we're lower down. The kidneys are, of course, bilateral. And you can see the cortices and the medulla are well defined when we give IV contrast. This is the spleen. We have the gallbladder here. And there's some calcifications within the gallbladder. And these are actually stones. Okay, So we have the black part is the gallbladder with the bile, and the white, the very white part is the stone. We have the head of the pancreas. It sits just to the right of the midline here. Again, we have the aorta, and right next to it, we have the inferior vena cava. And here we have contrast median loops of small bowel, as you can see there. Go lower down into the abdomen. Now we're at the lower edge of the kidneys. Okay, And again, we just see the tip of the liver here. And you're going to see a little tiny bit of the spleen on the other side. These structures are, again, the lower poles of the kidneys. We see the psoas muscle on each side here next to the uh, spine. Very important structure. And you'll notice that all of these uh, structures are outlined by black. And the black is fat, and the fat sits in the uh, retroperitoneum and in the mesentery as well. So it allows us to see these structures much clearer. This uh, piece of bowel with uh, this uh, black and uh, gray material in it, this is fecal material. And this is the transverse colon, the large bowel, as it comes across. Here we have the aortic bifurcation. The aorta is no longer here. It's bifurcated into the uh, common iliac arteries. And right next to it, we have the inferior vena cava. 
Now the pancreas deserves a little special attention because it's a it's a different kind of organ that you see over multiple uh, axial cuts. And if we look uh, uh, higher up, we'll see it here uh, with uh, the tail of the pancreas going towards the hilum of the spleen. And this is very typical. And the pancreas has that sort of uh, fluffy appearance. It's not as solid as the other organs are. Okay, and if we look very closely down the center of that, that structure, we can see a little black line. And that little black line is the pancreatic duct. Okay. If it's enlarged, it becomes very obvious. And if it's obstructed, as it would be in a cancer, then you can see it quite clearly. Here it's just very faintly visible. We have branches here of the celiac axis, which comes off the aorta. And if we go to the next image, which is lower down, this is where we're going to see the head of the pancreas, because it sits well below this area. So here's the head of the pancreas. In the middle of the head, we're going to see this little black structure here. This is the common uh, bile duct, which comes down through the, the uh, head of the pancreas to empty into the duodenum. The duodenum is going to be just sitting right next to the head of the pancreas on the right side. This structure, vascular structure, going across the aorta is the left renal vein. And it almost always takes a course uh, and passes in front of the aorta there. And in some individuals, it goes behind the aorta. OK, now, if we turn the, the study around and we do what we call coronal imaging, it gets a little easier to see uh, what we want to see. And most of our CT scans nowadays are 16 or 64 slice and can easily recreate all of the images in coronal or sagittal uh, format. So we're going to have a look at the coronal imaging now and look at some of the structures we can see. If we go to the very back of the abdomen, and we're looking at the retroperitoneum here. And here we can see both kidneys in the retroperitoneum. And these are f surrounded by fat. That's very important to remember that, because that fat allows us to see these structures on a plain film of the abdomen as well. We have the liver to the right again. And we have the kidneys. And right on top of the kidney, we have this little, again, this hat, which is the adrenal gland. Right immediately s s uh, in front of or central to the kidneys is the psoas muscle. And these psoas uh, muscles are, are important because we can see them on plain films, and they tell us that the retroperitoneum is, is OK. This is the spine. We can see the spleen over on this side the bony pelvis and the sacroiliac joints we can see there. Centrally, we see the, the bowel, which is sitting within the pelvis, and that might be a uterus below that. And finally, we have the glute gluteus muscles on, on either side. So this is the very back of If we move a little bit forward into the mid-abdomen, things change again. Here we can see the aorta. Again, this is a retroperitoneal structure. So it's sitting behind everything else. And uh, we can see it quite readily on the, in the mid-abdomen. We can see the renal arteries okay, going down from the aorta into the kidneys. There's the liver again. There's the spleen. And these, again, are the psoas muscles on either side. Coming even further forward, now we're going to see other vascular structures. And again, we're still seeing the retroperitoneum centrally. Again, the liver we can see here. This is the inferior vena cava. And the inferior vena cava, of course, courses through the liver as it, as it goes up towards the heart. So this is the inferior vena cava. And this structure, again, coming across the aorta is the left renal vein. There's the aorta. And again, the psoas muscles. And sitting on top of the psoas muscle here, on top of the psoas muscle, is this white structure, which is an artery. 
and these are the iliac arteries, one on each side. This is the right hip, and then the, again the spine. <coughs> So we're going to go a little further forward, and this is the ventral abdomen. This is just more or less just below the, the skin. Things change again, and here we don't see any retroperitoneal structures, really. Okay, so this is the porta hepatis. This is where all of the, the common bile duct, portal vein, hepatic artery, they all go into the liver at that particular point. This is the gallbladder, again, with the gallstone in, in the center of it. And we can see the stomach here. We know this is stomach because it's bright and there are folds in it, which, which are sort of concentric. This is large bowel. Again, it contains fecal material. All the contrast here is in the small bowel. All right, there's none in the large bowel. And often that's, you don't need to have contrast in the large bowel because you can pick it out fairly easily with the feces. So that's large bowel there. <coughs> We have the small bowel, which contains contrast media. And finally, below, we have the bladder. All these structures are easily seen on these coronal images. Symphysis pubis and the femoral artery. All right, right in front of the hip joint. Within the muscles is the femoral artery. OK, now we're going to take that anatomy that we sort of thought about on CT. It's easy to see on CT, particularly because we have uh, contrast media in the bowel, and we've got contrast media in the arteries and a little bit in the veins. So it's easy to see the structures, but now you have to try to see them uh, with abdominal imaging on a plain film, and this is a little bit more difficult. <coughs> the bones, which most of you should be very familiar with, this is a plain film of the abdomen. This is called a supine view, an AP supine view. <coughs> Excuse me. In the center, we have the spine, of course. These are lumbar vertebrae. And between the vertebrae are the disc spaces. This is the bony pelvis, as you know it. And you probably already know all of the parts of the pelvis, so I won't go into those. These are the sacroiliac joints on each side, the hip joints, and the symphysis pubis. These are the larger structures that you want to know for sure when you look at an abdomen. Finally, there's the acetabulum, and here is the femoral head. See if you can name all those structures without me telling you what they are. Now, the, the trick is to see the soft tissue. And so we go to a normal abdomen, the same one we saw before. And now we're going to look at the soft tissue. And the reason I can see the soft tissue uh, outlines here is because there's fat around the soft tissue. And x-rays go much more easily through fat to the other side than they go through soft tissue. So the soft tissue and the fat form an interface. The soft tissue appears white, and the fat right next to it appears black. And that allows us to see these structures. The first structure you should always look for is the psoas muscle. And so there's the psoas muscle on that side. Here it is on the other side. And it just that forms that triangular shape around the lumbar spine. You can sort of see an outline of a bean in the upper quadrant. And this is the kidney. And here's the kidney on the other side, which you should be able to, to recognize. Finally, we have a, a line there between white and black over the kidney, and this is the edge of the liver. And a similar line on the other side shows us the edge of the spleen. This little calcified density in the pelvis is what we call a flebolith. And there are many of these in many pelvises, and they're just little stones that form in the veins, and you'll see them over and over again. They don't mean anything. And the soft tissue density within the pelvis there is the bladder. Now what happens when organs enlarge? You can still see them. Um, sometimes it's not quite as easy, but other times it's quite easy to recognize <coughs> enlarged organs. In this normal view, we can see the spleen and, and liver clearly, the outline. And if we go to this view, the, we can tell that the 
liver and the spleen are enlarged. Okay? The kidneys are displaced downward by these enlarged structures. So this is the spleen over here, and you can see this tip of the spleen is down over the pelvis, and here's the edge of the liver. You can clearly see the kidneys below this because there's contrast media in the collecting systems. <coughs> here's another young man who came in um, who had been sick for some time, uh, very weak, uh, ill, couldn't uh, move around very well. And if we look at the plain film of the abdomen on this patient, we can see that there is an enlarged spleen. And that spleen is going down towards uh, the iliac crest. Okay? This uh, patient actually had mononucleosis, which can sometimes cause splenomegaly. Now we'll look at the retroperitoneal structures. On this side, we know that the kidneys on the normal are, are retroperitoneal, and both psoas margins are retroperitoneal. So what happens when we develop pancreatitis? Pancreatitis is caused by inflammation of the retroperitoneal pancreas, and it causes an outpouring of fluid into the retroperitoneal tissues, and it will bl obliterate all the fatty margins. So when a patient has pancreatitis, we lose the psoas margin, and we lose the outline of both kidneys. And you can see that quite clearly on this second view. Now, if we go to <coughs> the next view, let's just, uh, previous, previous. This is a normal patient. We can see the psoas margins here very clearly. And the reason we see them is they're outlined by fat. These are the lower ends of the kidneys, the very white part next to them. And again, these are retroperitoneal structures. Now, if we go to the next view, which shows pancreatitis, these are the psoas margins, and you'll see there's no black line around them. There's no fat. And that's because this phlegmon, or this edema, or this inflammation has assaulted all of the soft tissues in the retroperitoneum, and it's caused this white area all around the psoas muscle. So that's what happens in pancreatitis. Now we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> another line that we can see, and this is called the properitoneal fat line. Again, this is a normal supine view of the abdomen. Okay, You can see the kidneys, you can see the edge of the liver there, and if you look closely, you can see an interface between dark and white on either side. Okay, And this is called the properitoneal fat line. On the outside of this is a soft tissue of the abdominal wall, on the inside of is fat that is uh, in the peritoneum. So this is called a properitoneal fat line. Immediately next to this line is bowel. And this is the case on both sides. You can see large bowel. You can see little fecal material in the large bowel immediately adjacent to the properitoneal fat lines on both sides. Now when a patient gets fluid in the abdomen, what happens is there's separation of the bowel from the properitoneal fat line such as in this case. Here we have a patient who has ascites. And you can see the properitoneal fat line there. You can see it here as well, and down there. And you can also see the edge of the large bowel. This is cecum, and you can see the bowel there. It should sit immediately adjacent to the fat line, but it doesn't. And in between the bowel and the fat line is fluid. And this is called fluid in the pericolic gutter. And there's a pericolic gutter on both sides. Now, when people develop ascites, the first place the fluid goes is in the pelvis. After that, it starts to track up in the pericolic gutter on each side. And as it does so, it separates the bowel from the properitoneal fat line. And that's how we recognize it. One of the other things that ascites does is it causes the bowel to float into the center of the abdomen so that we can see all the bowel gas collecting centrally. It can also cause a hazy appearance to the abdomen, and it's harder to see the retroperitoneal structures when there's fluid. This is what it looks like on a CT scan. Here you can see the fluid. Um, this is the liver, and this is fluid around the liver and you can see it more central is in the pelvis. So we've sort of covered what the soft tissues look like. Now we're going to go on to talk about 
calcifications in the abdomen. It's very important to look at the abdomen for areas of calcification because a lot of uh, pathology is caused by calcifications in the abdomen. So we're going to just easily with an abdomen that looks like this. This is a normal supine abdomen. And can anybody see anything, uh, any calcium in this abdomen at all? Well, there's a little bit of calcium here. And this is calcification within the kidney on that side. And this are, these are called renal calculi. This lady has a condition called medullary sponge kidney. And she will make uh, calcifications that will stay in her kidney like this and sometimes that will float down the ureter. Here's another patient. This patient is a young boy who came in with bad pain in his back on the right side that was radiating down into his right testicle. And if we look very closely at the pelvis, we can see an area of calcification here in the distal ureter, probably in the distal ureter on the right side. You can see that area of calcification and just on the basis of this plain film we may be able to say that this patient has a renal calculus. Now in this particular case we did an IVP. There are two types of investigations that you can do for a calculus. One is an IVP and the other is a CT scan and I'm going to show you an example of both. In an IVP, we inject contrast media into a vein, and then we take pictures of the kidneys. Okay? If there is a, an obstruction to the kidney, there will always be a delay in the excretion of contrast on the affected side. In this particular case, we have contrast media in the pelvic cell system of the left kidney, and none in the right. And that implies that there's an obstruction or that that kidney on the right is not functioning appropriately. When there's a delay in the excretion of contrast media, there's going to be a delay in the opacification of the collecting system and the renal pelvis on that side. And sometimes that delay is quite, takes a long time to fill the pelvis and the ureter to the level of obstruction, which is what you have to do with an IVP. So this shows the left kidney is normal. It, there's almost no contrast left in it. On the right side, the kidney is dense and there's dense opacification of the pelvic cell system and ureter right down to the bladder here. And this is a 16-hour film. So it takes 16 hours for the contrast media to collect in that collecting system. When we get the patient to void, you can see the post-void film which shows complete interruption of the distal ureter on that side and this is because there's a stone in the ureter. You can't really see the stone because there's contrast media around it but this implies that there is a stone at that level. This is a similar case of a girl who came in uh, who had pain on the right side radiating down to her uh, bladder and you can see this tiny little speck of calcification down there, which actually represents a renal stone. Now in these patients where we do IVPs, we don't inject any contrast media. Most of the calculi contain at least some calcium, and we can see them easily on a non-enhanced scan. So what we're looking for on a CT scan, first of all, in the upper collecting system, we're looking for dilation of the pelvic cell system on the affected side. And then we're going to look for a little stone down here in the distal ureter. So those are the two things. And we do axial cuts all the way through the abdomen to show us these things. And we can diagnose a renal stone this way. Almost all of the patients who present with renal colic now get a CT scan. They don't get an IVP anymore. Here's another case of the same thing on the right side. You can see this huge dilated pelvic seal system with a stone in there. And this person is a stone former, so she's got a stone up there in the upper collecting system. And if we go lower down in the ureter, we can see a stone in the distal ureter as well. As soon as you relieve that and take that stone out, then that pelvic seal system will go back to a normal size. Okay, there's some calcium in this view. Can anybody tell me where it is? Well, this patient 
has an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And there's a great bulge in the aorta, which you can see here. And it's densely calcified, so you can actually see it on a plain film, quite commonly. If we were to do a CT scan, it would look like this. And you see the aorta, which is usually about 2 to 3 centimeters in diameter. This one's about 5 centimeters in diameter. So this is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And these patients have to be watched. Frequently, these uh, will rupture. And this is an example of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Again, you can see the calcification around the wall of the aorta. And and you can see the area of hemorrhage here. It's whiter compared to other areas. And any place where you're going to look for blood on a CT scan, it's going to look whiter than adjacent soft tissue. So this is the area of hemorrhage here around the aorta. You can see that there's obliteration of the fat around the psoas margin on the right side. And on the sagittal image, which is a reconstructed image. Again, centrally, you can see where the aorta is, where there's calcification. And around it is the area of hemorrhage. So this is what it looks like. OK, we've got some calcification on this film, which I'm sure most of you can see. It's in the right upper quadrant. And these are gallstones, OK? If we do an ups upright view, you can see that the stones layer out they're a little heavier than the bile, so the bile's on top and the stones are on the bottom, and you get what looks like an air fluid level. When we look for uh, gallstones, the commonest test that we use is ultrasound. And this is an example of an ultrasound of the right upper quadrant. And you can see here a tiny gallstone, which is that white area, which is sitting in the black area, which is the gallbladder, and immediately above it is the liver. Now below that stone, we have what is called an area of acoustic shadowing. That's that black shadow. And because the, th that shadow occurs because the um, sound waves will not go through a calcified structure. So instead, the sound waves bounce back, and we get behind that structure what is called a shadow. OK, so that's an acoustic shadow. And that's what we look for on ultra. Now, if we compare a gallstone with a polyp, which is a soft tissue structure, in the same uh, structure, gallbladder, here on the left side, you can see there's a small stone again with the area of acoustic shadowing. On the other side, you can see this small polyp that's sitting, soft tissue structure, and there's no acoustic shadowing behind that. That tells us that this is soft tissue and that this is not a gallstone. Another calcified structure here we're looking for. If you look within the pelvis on this 16-year-old boy, he has pain around his umbilicus, which subsequently moved to the right lower quadrant. So we're looking for an appendicitis in this patient. And we see instead on the plain film, we see this calcified structure, which is called an appendicolith. All right, now these are not f a frequent finding. And the best test to look for appendicitis is going to be uh, ultrasound in a patient who is young and thin. But whenever you see an appendicolith or a stone like this in the right lower quadrant, you're going to be suspicious that this is uh, an important finding. And most of these appendices are removed prophylactically, even if the patient does not have appendicitis. If there is evidence of an appendicolith, then the elective surgery is used to take out the appendix. OK, the last thing we're going to do is look at the bowel gas distribution within the abdomen. And this is really uh, important. We use this uh, more than any other time uh, in emergency departments and on the ward to try and tell what's in a patient's belly. Now, the small bowel sits in the center of the abdomen, OK? It's, it, this is a part of a small bowel follow through. And you can see here multiple loops of small bowel that are sort of centrally placed. If we look at the mucosal pattern 
of this bowel, we can see that there are lines that go all the way across the bowel, and these are called plica semicircularis, or valvuli conoventes. And uh, they tell us that we're looking at small bowel when we see those lines. On the other hand, the large bowel, which here has barium in it, forms a window frame around the small bowel, which is central. So the large bowel sits right against the properitoneal fat line on both sides. And if you look carefully, you can see the fat in the peritoneum there, and that the bowel is right next to it. Okay. Now the large bowel has uh, lines that go across it as well, but these lines only go part way across, and they're called hostra. And that gives us another way to recognize the large bowel is because of these lines. Now, often um, when we look at plain films of the abdomen, we're going to see fecal material. And the fecal material uh, on people with constipation, this is usually more stool than there should be in the, in the bowel. And here you can see the black part in, incorporated within the white part like little bubbles. And, and this is all f what we call stool or fecal material. You can see it there, you can see it here, you can see it on the right side as well. And this uh, patient is probably constipated because he has a fair amount of stool present. On the other hand, when you get someone who's fecally impacted, they have stool throughout their large bowel and in particular, they have stool in their rectum. And here you can see this rectum is greatly distended with, again, amorphous material that has air within it, soft tissue. This is feces, okay? This is fecal impaction, what it looks like. Now there's several gas patterns that you should be able to recognize on plain film. You should be able to recognize a generalized ileus, a localized ileus, small bowel obstruction, and a large bowel obstruction. So we're just going to go through the different patterns and what they mean. Generalized ileus is usually seen after surgery or intervention, something where there's been handling of the bowel, and it will clear up without any problems, okay? It'll go, it's caused by paralysis of the bowel, and there's very little peristalsis, so there are no bowel sounds to speak of, and the patient doesn't pass any gas for a while, but this will pass on its own. And when you do a chest, an x-ray of the abdomen, you're going to see distension of loops of large and small bowel. You're going to see very few and small air fluid levels, very few. And there is usually air in the rectum as well. That means that you've got air throughout the bowel and there's no obstruction. On the other hand, a localized ileus is, again, a paralysis of the bowel. But it's usually seen in response to a localized inflammatory process, such as pancreatitis or gallbladder disease. So the bowel immediately adjacent to the inflamed organ dilates, okay? It becomes distended, and it contains an air fluid level, okay? So when we see that, it can uh, help us indicate where the inflammation is occurring. So when we're imaging uh, the abdomen, we're going to do a supine view, and we're going to do two dependent views, and these are really important. You can do an upright and a decubitus, or you can do either one of these two, but whenever you do uh, plain film imaging, you should try to get a dependent view as well. I'm going to show you some examples. All right, this is an example of a generalized ileus. Okay, we've got air everywhere in the bowel. We've got large bowel, we've got small bowel. It's only mildly distended. It's not very much uh, distension. Again, we have a supine and a decubitus view. Here we can see the patient's laying on his side, right side up. And the reason we put the right side up is so if there's any free air, we can see it lying adjacent to the liver on that side. Okay, so we've got loops of large bowel, we've got loops of small bowel, and we've got no air fluid levels at all. So this is a generalized ileus, and this will clear up on its own. On the other hand, this is a localized ileus that we sometimes see in patients who have gallbladder problems or inflammation. Here you can see a distended loop of large bowel, probably at the hepatic flexure, okay? And if we do 
a upright view, we can see that there's an air fluid level in that bowel. That implies that that small loop is probably uh, paralyzed. We've got a little small bowel loops around there as well, which are mildly distended. And this is what we would call a localized ileus. Now, <coughs> when we go on to obstruction, there's different patterns we see here. A small bowel obstruction will give you distension of loops of small bowel with air fluid levels. The distension usually extends to the level of the obstruction and not beyond. And the bowel is usually evacuated beyond the, the point of obstruction. So that if the small bowel is obstructed, that usually uh, allows uh, evacuation of everything in the large bowel, and the large bowel is collapsed. Okay. And a small bowel obstruction is important because it will require either intervention, surgery, or resting the bowel. And you put down an NG tube and you, and you let the bowel rest. A large bowel obstruction is when there's distension of loops of small and large bowel, usually. And there are air fluid levels, too. Now, the bowel again, large bowel, is all evacuated beyond the point of obstruction. So if the large bowel is dilated to the splenic flexure, and there's nothing in the rectum or beyond the splenic flexure, this implies that the area of obstruction is at the splenic flexure. Now, usually what happens is this requires further investigation, either with barium enema, resting the bowel, or surgery. And nowadays, CT scan is, is most uh, commonly used to see um, the area of obstruction. All right, so here's a normal supine view, and here's one where we have a small bowel obstruction, you can see that there's dilated small bowel in the mid-abdomen. <coughs> These are both supine views. Here we can see that the bowel is larger than normal. And if you look very carefully, you can see that the uh, mucosal folds go all across the bowel. And this is important because this indicates that this is small bowel. And these are plica semicircularis. Now here again, we have a supine view, the same one we saw before, and an upright view. This is a dependent view. And you can see here on the supine view that we have the dilated loops again. But on the upright view, we see definite air fluid levels. Okay? It's really important. These always occur in a small bowel obstruction. Again, <coughs> we've got massively distended loops of bowel here. Is it large bowel or small bowel? Well, this is small bowel because, again, those mucosal folds are going all the way across. So this implies that this is small bowel obstruction. On the supine view, we see lots of loops in the center. We don't see any air in the rectum or large bowel. And if we go to the upright view, again, we can see these air fluid levels. Now here's another particularly interesting case. Here we can see distended loops of small bowel in the abdomen. There's very little air or none in the large bowel at all. So this implies that there's a small bowel obstruction. Now if we go to the upright and decubitus view, something happens. And here we can see that there is free air. And if you look here, you can see air under the right hemidiaphragm here. You can see an air fluid level. Maybe a little air on the other side as well. These air fluid levels are here. OK. And here on the decubitus view, again, with the right side up, we can see free air here collecting against the liver. And again, we have these air fluid levels, which tells us that this is a small bowel obstruction. Lines go all the way across the bowel, indicating that this is small bowel, not large bowel. And there's virtually no gas at all in the large bowel. If we have a CT scan and we're looking for free air, we can see very, very small quantities of free air in a CT. Here we see this liver right here. And we see fluid and a tiny bit of air present. And that's all you need to tell you that there is a perforation somewhere in the gut. And then you have to look further to find out where that is. 
Now, one of the important things that we do is try to recognize when there's free air on a supine view, and this can be very difficult, okay? We need that dependent view, the upright or the decubitus. It really is an important view, but sometimes the patient is so sick that we can't get those dependent views. So we have to try to recognize air on a supine view. And if there is air present on a supine view, what happens is in one area or another, you can see both sides of the bowel wall. And in this particular case here, there are two areas, one where we can see the bowel wall and the other where we can't. So if we look here in this left, right upper quadrant, you can see air inside the bowel, then you see a white line and there's air outside the bowel. And that means you can see the bowel wall. However, if you look down here on the right side, left side, sorry, you can see air within the bowel, but you do not see the bowel wall. So this means if you can see both sides of the bowel wall, it means there's free air. And over on this side, if you cannot see the sides, both sides, it's normal. Now, usually both can occur in the same uh, image that you get, but usually um, if there's free air, you can see a lot of areas where there's a uh, bowel wall. Now, if we take the same patient here and we do a decubitus film, now we can see that the air is leveling out here against the liver, so that's free air. Okay, so the next case is a large bowel obstruction. Here you can see lots of distension of loops of small bowel and large bowel all the way around. Now there's no air in the rectum and there's no air in the colon, the descending colon here. So we would imagine that the obstruction is probably at the splenic flexure. We can identify large bowel because the uh, the hostra just go part way across, whereas the small bowel, the, semi, uh, the plica semicircularis, go all the way around. So this is large bowel all around the outside, forms the window frame, and the small bowel in the center. If we do an upright view, again, we're going to see air fluid levels. And we can see air fluid levels in the large bowel and within the small bowel as well. And that's important. Now, the last air, air pattern you should be able to recognize is a volvulus. <coughs> there are two types of volvulus. There's a sigmoid volvulus and a cecal volvulus. The sigmoid volvulus can become redundant as the patient gets older, and it sometimes twists on its own mesentery. With it, when this happens, it forms a U-shaped air-filled loop that rises out of the pelvis. Uh, this <coughs> loop is caused by a twisting of the mesentery and the bowel so that gas within the loop is obstructed, plus there's obstruction of the large bowel and probably the small bowel proximal to the U. Now a cecal volvulus is caused by a twist of the cecal mesentery and it forms a bean-shaped air-filled loop that rises out of the right side of the pelvis and points towards the left hemidiaphragm and this is associated with a small bowel obstruction, but the rest of the large bowel is usually normal. Look at an example of a sigmoid volvulus. You can see here this large air strape thing, air filled structure rising out of the pelvis. This is a volvulus, okay? And when it happens, it's associated with obstruction of the large bowel, and you can see lots of distended loops of large bowel here in this abdomen. Again, if we do dependent views, an upright and a decubitus, you can see air fluid levels in the volvulus. That's in the single loop, the midline. And you can also see air fluid levels in the large bowel all around the outside, and that's because the large bowel is also obstructed. Now, this is an example of a cecal volvulus. Okay. You can see that there's marked distension of loops of small bowel here, okay? This is all small bowel, it's in the center, and there's this big air-filled loop here that's sitting there uh, in, in the center, sort of bean-shaped, pointing up towards the left hemidiaphragm, and this is what a cecal volvulus looks like, okay? 
Now compare this again to the sigmoid volvulus and you can see that there's a very difference and the sigmoid volvulus of course is rising out of the pelvis. Sometimes it's hard to tell one from the other but usually you can figure it out just on plain film. One of the last things we're going to talk about is uh, infarction of the bowel. Um, and when we infarct the bowel we get something that's called thumb printing. Okay? Now if we look at this plain film here we can see that the bowel loops are thickened. And there's thickening of the bowel wall between the loops so that one bowel loop should be right smack next to the other but here we've got thickened bowel that's caused by the bowel wall of the the transverse colon and the small bowel and the two together have formed this this ridge. If we look at individual hostra of the large bowel you can see that those are thickened as well. And if we go to the barium anima you can see here uh, on a barium anima showing the sigmoid colon that there are areas of irregularity in the bowel wall where it looks like someone took their thumb and pushed it in to the mucosa and that's why we call this thumb printing. Okay? Now thumb printing is caused by enteritis or colitis. Any kind of inflammation of the bowel will cause this. Crohn's disease, um, ulcerative colitis, any kind of uh, colitis that you get in the hospital. Infarction of the bowel will also cause this thumb printing or thickening of the bowel loops and hemorrhage into the bowel wall in some conditions uh, will cause hemorrhage uh, particularly in juveniles and uh, that will give you the same impression. If we look a little bit further and if this process goes on for a longer time um, we can get air escaping into the bowel wall and this is well seen on the CT scan of the abdomen where you can see that the bowel wall is outlined by air here. Going a little bit further the air in the bowel wall extends into the, uh, the mesenteric veins and will collect in vascular structures in the mesentery. Now this is a very dangerous condition and once air starts to enter the bowel wall it's very important that, they, that surgery is done almost immediately because if not then the patient will die. The infarcted bowel has to be removed. And if we go a little bit later on this patient eventually died but here again you can see air in the bowel wall. Okay, You can see air in little vessels that are seen centrally in the mesentery and finally that air in the mesenteric veins lead to the portal vein and you get air in the portal vein and this you can see over the liver. So this is air in the portal vein. Alright, well that's the end of my lecture. I, I hope that it's been helpful to you. I invite any comments, um, anything else um, that is relevant that you would like to have discussed, let me know. Okay, again my name is Rebecca Peterson. Thanks.